We begin CBS 2 News at 11 with breaking news. That car right there slamming into a 7-Eleven. And Stu Mandel is live in Sky 2 over this scene in Covina. Stu. That's right, happening out here at the corner of Gladstone and Azusa Boulevard. You see that 7-Eleven right there. Now, the PD, have, they have basically said that this was an accident and actually allowed that person to drive their car home. Nobody was injured. You can see a lot of broken glass out here. does seem like the 7-Eleven might be closed at least until they get this cleaned up. Live in Sky 2 over Covina. I'm Stu Mandel. Back to you two in the studio. All right, could take a while, Stu. Thank you. A grandfather of six punched and killed at a jack-in-the-box. Was it over a parking space tonight? Investigators hope security video will help track down his killer. Deputies found the grandfather lying on the ground in a pool of blood. Now they're now looking for witnesses to this violent attack. And CBS 2's Hermela Aragawi is live in Lancaster with the video of it happening. Hermela. Good evening, Pat and Jeff. It was one strike, but it was a deadly, a deadly one, and it left behind a huge mess in the parking lot of the restaurant. You'll see uh, some water right there on the ground. That is where firefighters hose down the victim's blood. He really was an awesome, awesome man, an awesome father. A grandfather of six is killed moments after leaving a jack-in-the-box. Security video shows Frank Borsati walking out of the restaurant into his truck. He appears to have some sort of exchange with the people in the car that's blocking him in. And then a man walks out of the passenger side and strikes him. Borsati was taken to a local hospital and pronounced dead there. A longtime friend tells us the family is in shock and mourning tonight. Frank Borsati, of all people for this to happen to, he would be the first person to forgive the man that hurt him. They took away a man from his family and his wife of 40 plus years. Police say doesn't appear the suspect and the victim know each other and they tell us they have little information on the attacker. He was a passenger in a four-door champagne colored vehicle that was last seen uh, northbound on uh, 10th Street West. People familiar with the area tell us this doesn't surprise them. It's not strange this town. I mean, this town's went down over the past few years or more, and it's just only getting worse. The sheriff's office tells us they're on the hunt for the killer tonight, and they're asking anyone with information to call them. Reporting live in Lancaster, Hermela Argawi, CBS 2 News. Thank you, Hermela. Now, four police pit maneuvers, and the driver just kept going. Tonight, we're learning of the erratic and dangerous behavior of that driver just weeks before he led police on today's wild chase across Southern California. CBS 2's Jeff Nguyen is live in Inglewood with this new video. Jeff. Pat, this mom says that Carl Flores showed up here on New Year's Day with a metal pipe, walked to the back towards the prayer area, and attacked a member. And tonight, we have new video from that day. Tonight, an up-close look at the man who police identified as Carl Flores as officers led him out of a San Diego County hospital. Flores is a suspect in a three-hour pursuit that stretched from Culver City down to the Camp Pendleton area. Early on, his windshield took on this damage after police say he hit a man who was riding a scooter. Police say that victim is expected to survive. After that, officers tried to use the pit maneuver four times. On the first attempt, they spun his Honda 180, but no good. The second was much the same, and he managed to weave between police cars. The third pit was so hard, the back window flew off along with the rear bumper. Officers got out with guns drawn, but Flores was able to hit the gas and got away. The fourth pit sent his car sliding sideways, but he threaded between the black and whites. He got into a fight right here? Uh, yes. Javed Bava is the president of the Islamic Society of Inglewood, where Flores attended for years. This is video of Flores walking into the mosque with what we're told is a metal pipe, which Bava says was used to attack a member. He didn't look behind or anything. He just started beating him up. People who know Flores say they recognize his car during that long chase in which police used a spike strip in San Diego County before his Honda ran out of gas, which led to a tense standoff. Police had to use a dog to finally arrest him. Back at the mosque, people here say Flores threw eggs at a worshiper one day after Tuesday's fight, and they say he was seen driving by the mosque this morning before the chase. I'm sad. I'm not angry, but I'm very sad. And police say that they initially tried to pull Flores over because his car had some damages that are considered 
code violations. In the meantime, worshipers here say that he is a veteran of the military and that he suffers from PTSD. Reporting live in Inglewood, Jeff Nguyen, CBS2 News. Jeff, thank you. The family of a mother and daughter killed in a suspected DUI crash may have reason to fear they'll never see justice after a stunning development tonight. JoJo Gardner and her nine-year-old daughter, Peyton Castillo, are now being remembered after that tragedy on the 22 freeway. A man arrested in connection with the Garden Grove crash is now free, released from a Santa Ana jail late tonight. Melvin, were you using drugs? You're going to get behind the wheel again. Do you plan to do that? I don't do drugs. Were you drinking that night? No. Melvin, what do you have to say to the family? A mother and a daughter are dead. Melvin Branch was initially booked on charges that included driving under the influence. He was supposed to be arraigned today, but the district attorney says there is not enough evidence to file criminal charges, at least at this time. So he was released. Well, tonight, just hours after Democrats took control over the House, they passed bills to reopen the government without funding for the border wall. And they're also taking President Trump to task on other issues. Yeah, they're vowing to investigate every inch of his presidency, his campaign, his business dealings, and more. CBS 2's Tom Wade joins us now with all the developments, or at least most of them, out of Washington, D.C. Just another friendly day on Capitol Hill. Everyone getting along, right? Yeah. Freshman day. Freshman day on a government partial shutdown. So, all right, so the battle over the border wall shows no signs of being resolved. And tonight, a video posted on social media could make for a very interesting first full day for Speaker Pelosi tomorrow. Tonight, the new Democratic majority voted to reopen the government. The bill is passed. The votes were on two bills that did not include money for President Trump's border wall, which makes it unlikely the Senate will take up the bills in their current form. That means the partial government shutdown continues. Nancy Pelosi, I extend to you this gavel. Earlier in the day, a triumphant Nancy Pelosi once again wielded the gavel as Speaker of the House. But the honeymoon may be short-lived. Tonight, one of the new Democratic members of the House, Rashida Tlaib, was out and about and made these comments to a small crowd. And when your son looks at you and says, Mama, look, you won, bullies don't win. And I said, baby, they don't, because we're going to go in there, we're going to impeach the mother... Whether there will be fallout is unclear. Pelosi has been careful to rein in talk of impeachment as she takes over as speaker. And it's not clear if this video will overshadow a historic day for Democrats, where more than 100 female House members were sworn in, including the first two Native American women and the first two Muslim women. As Democrats celebrated, President Trump chimed in this afternoon as he continued his demands for a border wall. You can call it a barrier, you can call it whatever you want, but essentially we need protection in our country. So now we wait to see how the GOP-controlled Senate will handle the bills sent to them tonight by the House, but all indications are Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell will not allow a vote without border wall funding. Democrats and Republicans are supposed to meet with the president on Friday. Jeff. All right, Tom, thanks. Now back to Los Angeles. The teachers' union is responding tonight to papers filed in federal court by the LAUSD. The district wants to stop special education teachers from taking part in a possible strike. Today, Mayor Eric Garcetti talked about that stalemate. He offered space in City Hall as neutral ground for the teachers' union and the district to try to hammer out their differences. But UTLA, United Teachers Los Angeles, said it is rejecting the district's latest offer because the pay raise is still contingent on health care rollbacks. The teachers' union released this statement tonight on the district's legal move on the special ed teachers, saying in part, many of the parents who are supportive of our campaign and our possible strike are parents of special education students. They know that we are fighting for their children. It appears both sides, though, are willing to negotiate, at least by Monday, if they don't come to an agreement, a strike could begin as soon as Thursday. Well, a number of trash can fires have ignited a fear in Santa Monica tonight that a possible arsonist could be on the loose. CBS 2's Rachel Kim is live in Santa Monica with details on those fires. Rachel. Yeah, Pat, Santa Monica police here have had at least 15 trash fires set close to people's homes in the past two weeks. So now they're working with fire arson investigators to see if they have a possible serial arsonist on their hands. Fire! Big, and it's next to an electric.
electric pole. A scared Santa Monica resident recorded this scene near her home in the 1100 block of 12th Street. She and others believe the fire was intentionally set. The fact that it could catch fire to the electric pole or the residential homes nearby is extremely alarming and worrisome and could keep all of us awake at night. After seeing a series of fires that have been set in or near trash cans close to residential buildings, the Santa Monica Police Department is now investigating what they believe to be arson. They say on December 22nd, there were eight fires. Then on January 1st, there were seven more. We need to put an end to this crime. It's unacceptable. Investigators say all of the fires have been set north of Santa Monica Boulevard. They're primarily happening in alleyways. The time frames of the fires vary, so detectives haven't found a pattern yet. It's very concerning. I uh, feel it could, it may be the start of a firebug. It could get bigger. Fortunately, no reports of injuries or major damage, but residents and police want this to stop before the fires spread to structures. I am talking to all of my neighbors about it. I'm just going to, I kind of keep an eye out anyways, but I'm just going to make sure I know what people are doing when they're doing it. Police say they don't have a suspect yet, but they are looking for clues and any security video. If you can help investigators, please call Santa Monica Police. Reporting live tonight in Santa Monica, Rachel Kim, CBS 2 News. On the road to recovery, a heartwarming update on Chloe, the little dog left for dead in Long Beach. We'll tell you how she's defying expectations. And the Paris torture house is up for auction. Still ahead, we'll give you a look inside and tell you the highest bid. And jumping to escape the flames, an apartment building goes up in flames as residents and firefighters team up to save lives. Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm Garth Kemp. Coming up, not quite as cold tonight, but there's rain on the way. Your forecast is coming up.